Good morning. Um, thank you very much to the program committee and my buddy Peter for inviting me out to Phoenix. Uh, I, like the visitors from Chicago, uh, left the frigid northeast yesterday, so I'm very happy to be here and thinking about working on my tan, which will just kill my plastic surgery friend. Um, so Peter asked me to talk about what's new in resuscitation, and uh, that's kind of what I'm going to talk about, uh, not only um, from a fluid standpoint, but also from a technique standpoint. So my objectives are going to be to briefly review damage control resuscitation, because I believe that this audience is intimately familiar with damage control, but more importantly, discuss the controversies that exist in the uh, 2014 year regarding the use of colloid, crystalloid, and plasma resuscitation. And then I'm going to put in a plug for Tom Scalia and his people out of um, shock trauma in Maryland regarding a novel adjunct endovascular technique for resuscitation. Speaking of Scalia, who is also a friend, um, he said in 2000, and actually in 2000, damage control is a way of thinking that uses standard principles in a slightly different way when caring for the most critically injured patients, or a paradigm shift. And while you can debate whether or not he is truly one of the great masters, I do believe that uh, damage control resuscitation has revolutionized the way that we are treating trauma patients in the year 2014. So what is damage control surgery? Damage control surgery is clearly the control of hemorrhage, the arrest of contamination, and then temporizing the patient, resuscitating them, and bringing them back to the operating room. Damage control resuscitation is an adjunct to damage control surgery, and the guiding principle of damage control resuscitation is that any fluid that does not clot or carry oxygen should be suspect i.e., the years of giving large volumes of crystalloid resuscitation before beginning blood and blood product resuscitation are hopefully over. The other concept that has uh, come out over the last 10 to 15 years is the concept of deliver deliberate hypotension or maintaining a mean arterial pressure in the 60s and a systolic in the 90s. What deliberate hypotension allows, you, uh, allows us to do is reduce blood loss from open vessels prior to surgical control minimizes the wash off of clot and therefore rebleeding, and without aggressive resuscitation prior to control of definitive surgical hemorrhage, minimizes the dilution of factors and platelets. If you look at this study by Rick Dutton et al. in 2002, he demonstrated clearly that mortality is not impacted by a deliberate hypotension resuscitation. The mortality in the group with systolic blood pressure greater than 100 versus the mortality in the group with the systolic blood pressure of 70 was 92% in both groups. The only statistically significant um, finding in this study was the average blood pressure, which I would uh, suggest is an, an entry point for the study. Interestingly enough, those patients who were maintained with a systolic blood pressure in the 70s had a higher overall injury severity score and the theoretically should have done worse, but did not. So when I was growing up, back when dinosaurs walked the earth and we walked both ways uphill in the snow without shoes um, to go to school, uh, the standard resuscitation paradigm was three bags of crystalloid to one unit of cells. If there was no response, then we thought about or uh, three bags of crystalloid to whatever the anticipated blood loss was, followed by blood. And then once you resuscitated the patient with either six to ten units of cells, you started to give FFP, and then you went back to crystalloid. However, there was never any data to support this paradigm for resuscitation other than if you give a normal human being um, three times the amount of blood loss that they had, a third of the volume or what they lost would stay intervascularly. And just because we've always done it doesn't mean that we need to continue to do it. So hemostatic resuscitation works at preventing coagulopathy, not treating it, limits crystalloids, stresses early use of blood and, and blood factors, and tries to avoid the uh, iatrogen uh, iatrogenic resuscitation injury. When you look at these data by Borgman et al. in 2007, you can clearly say that mortality is reduced by a relative one-to-one to one-and-a-half one to one uh, ratio of blood to FFP, and this is military data. But dil dilution is inevitable, and this is actually a study that drove home to me that even if we are resuscitating patients at one-to-one-to-one, to one to one, we may not be resuscitating them entirely. 
This is an ex vivo study, so this is mixing things in a lab. This is not mixing things in a human. But if you take whole blood and you break it down into one unit of cells, one unit of plasma, and one unit of platelets, what you get back when you give that one whole, um, or the 500 cc's of blood, is the patient receives 650 cc's of fluid, which has an average hematocrit of 30, a platelet count of 88, and about 65% of the coagulation factors that a normal human being has circulating. So a one-to-one-to-one -to -one -to -one resuscitation is not necessarily truly one-to-one-to-one. -to -one -to -one. So let's talk a little bit about plasma resuscitation because I think that the military data clearly stresses that early aggressive uh, transfusion for hemorrhagic shock improves outcomes. But how much plasma should we give and what are the putative downsides of resuscitating with plasma? This is USC data published in the uh, Journal of the American College of Surgeons in 2010. And what it demonstrates is that if you, as you increase the number of FFP over a 12-hour period, you have an increasing odds ratio in the development of overall complications, which is greatest at more than six units of cells. And what this uh, shows in, is about an odds ratio of 1.7 1, 1, uh, compared to those patients who do not receive plasma at all. And a similar, amount, a similar pattern is seen in the development of ARDS, or adult respiratory distress syndrome, Again, you get to a statistically significant odds ratio at about an FFP transfusion rate of six units of cells over 12 hours. This is data from the GLUE grant uh, published by Watson et al. in the Journal of Trauma in 2009. Again, looking at mortality, multi-system organ failure, um, nosocomial infection is NI and ARDS, and you can see a statistically significant increase in the, in the incidence of multi-system organ failure in ARDS in an independent hazards ratio for transfusion with FFP. Interestingly enough, if you transfuse patients with cryoprecipitate, this is not seen. So there may be something that's different between FFP and cryoprecipitate that we don't quite understand at the current time. And this odds ratio, again, becomes statistically significant the more, um, or more statistically significant, the more FFP that you give with the, the cutoff appearing to be around six units of FFP. And this holds true for ARDS as well. So what Watson et al. concluded was that in patients who survived their initial injury, FFP was independently associated with a greater risk of developing multisystem organ failure and ARDS, while cryo was associated with a lower mechanism or a lower risk of multisystem organ failure and suggested further studies. There are further studies in the literature. Multiple studies demonstrate that FFP is associated with increased nosocomial infections and um, complications associated with the resuscitation. I cut those out because I wanted to come in under the 25 minutes, but my take home message is that ratio based resuscitation is clearly associated with a decrease in mortality, but that increasing volumes of FFP are associated with increased infection, ARDS, and multi system organ failure. So I, I encourage you as you resuscitate your massively injured patients to consider exactly what your ratio is going to be. Are you going to be a one-to-one -one person? Or are you going to be a one-to-one-and-a-half one person? Or are you going to be a one-to-two person, one unit of cell, oh, I'm sorry, two units of cells to one unit of FFP? And I think that is the type of study that we need to do moving forward to delineate exactly how much is just enough. So let's talk a little bit about crystalloids. Again, remember, I grew up in the school where everybody got a lot of ringers and a lot of saline, and then we thought about giving them blood. This is data out of Tulane, um, published in 2012, with a planned restrictive fluid resuscitation. So these are the patients who received a small volume of fluid planned versus a large volume of crystalloid and had an odds ratio of 0 0.69, which is statistically uh, significant for mortality. This is data out of Harvard Review, published again in 2012 in the Journal of Trauma, demonstrating that uh, a ratio of crystalloid to pectoroid blood cells of greater than 1 and a half to 1, which is 1,500 cc's of crystalloid to one unit of pectoroid blood cells, is associated with an increased incidence of multisystem organ failure, ARDS, and abdominal compartment syndrome. 
Interestingly enough, this did not seem to impact the late complications, which are usually septic complications in these patients. So late ARDS and late abdominal compartment syndrome were not impacted by the amount of crystalloid resuscitation given in the trauma bay and in the operating room. However, it was the early ARDS and the early abdominal compartment syndrome that were directly reflected by crystalloid resuscitation. So I guess my take home point on this is the crystalloid resuscitation should probably be limited to, in trauma patients to less than 1,500 cc's of crystalloid to one unit of packed red blood cells. And again, I think these data need to be um, studied in a prospective fashion. Now I'm going to go to my favorite pet peeve, which is colloids. And I firmly believe, up, or believed up until about 2013 that colloids were the drug of the devil, among others. Um, and I may have been proven right or proven wrong, you all can decide. The putative effects of colloid are that they create an oncotic pressure gradient to drive fluid back into the intravascular space and selectively expand the intravascular space. The downsides are that if you have a leaky capillary, you may have um, leak in shock states. Clearly, crystalloid is cheaper than colloid. And human derived factor, uh, uh, products may be infectious. And there's some suggestion that there may be some unwanted immunologic effects or renal injury associated particularly with the starch-based colloids. In a uh, Co Cochrane review in 2012, um, there was a rather sweeping statement that there was no evidence from randomized controlled trials that resuscitation with colloids reduces the risk of death compared with resuscitation in crystalloids and that their continued use cannot be justified outside of the context of randomized controlled trials. Fortunately, people took this challenge on, and this is a uh, paper that was published in the New England Journal of Medicine shortly after the Cochrane Review came out, looking at hydroxyethyl starch in sepsis. So not really a trauma resuscitation, but large volume resuscitation with capillary leak. And their conclusions were, and this study was stopped early, that severe sep uh, patients with severe sepsis assigned to fluid resuscitation with starch had an increased risk of death at 90 days and were more likely to require renal replacement therapy. So I was ecstatic when that New England Journal paper came out because I started to tell my residents there's absolutely no reason in the world that we should ever use colloid for any reason in patients with hemorrhagic shock. And then the CRYSTAL trial came out. And the CRYSTAL trial was published about a year ago in JAMA and it was a randomized, non-blinded study of resuscitation from acute hypovolemic shock, so the type of patients that we're talking about with trauma. This study was also terminated early because the colloid group had less fluid requirement, less vasopressor use, fewer days on the ventilator, and no difference in mortality. So theoretically improved outcomes. I will tell you that there are some challenges with this, with this trial. The colloid that was chosen was uh, attending physician dependent. So it was a gamish of um, albumin and starches. There's probably a bias towards the albumin group. So again, I'm going to leave it up to you, but my take home on colloid resuscitation is that it remains controversial. It may be associated with a higher risk of death and renal dysfunction, particularly if you use starches. And then if you are going to use a colloid resuscitation in the management of a trauma patient, perhaps good old albumin is going to come back into favor. So let's talk briefly about adjuncts to hemostatic resuscitation. Um, thromboelastography is being currently uh, touted by the American College of Surgeons for use in level one trauma centers be as uh, being an effective way to guide resuscitation rather than using a standard cookbook ratio-based resuscitation. Thromboelastography is capable of assessing platelet function, fibrinogen levels, and fibrin fibrinolysis and allows you to have a more directed administration for your resuscitation. And this is what your graphs look like when you, when you uh, get a TEG, uh, which takes 30 minutes, incidentally. Uh, normal in the left upper quadrant, thrombocytopenia or low fibrinogen uh, on the left lower quadrant, lysis, and then factor deficiency. The other thing that was greater than sliced bread when I was coming out of residency and fellowship was recombinant factor 7A. And I think recombinant factor 7A has really had its heyday um, and is disappearing the way of the dodo bird, which has happened to a lot of things that I did when I was a resident. 
Um, early studies demonstrated decreased transfusion requirements and decreased 24 and 30 day mortality. However, later studies could not confirm the above findings at all. Um, there is some question as to whether or not the use of recombinant factor 7A may remain useful in a, uh, bad liver trauma and closed head injury, and certainly it may be the only modality for reversal of some of the new anti uh, anticoagulants which have made life interesting. TXA, I'm sure you have all heard of. Uh, it is an old drug. It binds plasminogen um, and inhibited, inhibits fibrinolysis, resulting in decreased blood loss. In the CRASH-2 trial, uh, 20,000 patients were randomized. TXA patients had reduced in-hospital mortality and reduced mortality directly attributable to hemorrhage. This was confirmed by the MATTER study, which is a military review of the use of TXA in theater, which also had an unadjusted reduction in mortality, a survival improvement, particularly in those patients with massive transfusion, and an odds ratio for survival of 7.3. So a Cochrane review in 2011 said that the TXA may safely reduce mortality and bleeding trauma patients. Every effort should be made to treat patients as soon as possible. I will incur uh, my one caveat on TXA is that it should only be used in massively bleeding patients or patients who activate massive transfusion protocols because there's, there is some evidence to suggest that there is an increased incidence of DVT and PE in those patients who do, do not need the drug. Uh, so moving on, um, the last thing that I'm going to talk about are adjuncts to resuscitation and uh, some of the data coming out of Maryland shock trauma. This is an anterior lateral thoracotomy and I believe that in the next five to ten years we will not be teaching this to our residents and medical students except for penetrating cardiac injuries, which is unfortunate because it's an awesome operation. <laughs> However, Many of the uh, e reasons for doing an anterior lateral thoracotomy are to stop bleeding and palliating the patient so that you can get them to the operating room for management of ongoing hemorrhage. And Megan Brenner, Todd Rasmussen, and Tom Scalia have developed a REBOA, or a retrograde endovascular balloon occlusion of the aorta. And what they do is they float this balloon during resuscitation to completely occlude the aorta as an adjunct to getting the patient to the operating room. They get surgical control of hemorrhage and then drop the balloon. This is the balloon catheter. As you can see, it is a balloon catheter that is floated through a percutaneous sheath in the groin. And it's very useful for the management of patients with hemodynamically unstable pelvic fractures as demonstrated in this uh, picture. This is a uh, chest x-ray demonstrating appropriate placement um, above the celiacs for the balloon. They then inf inflate the balloon. You do have to make sure that you're in the right place before you blow the balloon up. They then inflate the balloon, shoot a contrast study, and you can see there's complete occlusion of the aorta at the level of the diaphragmatic hiatus. And this is a CT scan. Why they put a balloon up and then went to CAT scan, we can debate. Um, because I always tell my residents the presence of a CAT scanner does not mandate a CAT scan. Um, but this clearly demonstrates the balloon floated in the, super, uh, or in the uh, diaphragmatic hiatus with complete occlusion of the aorta. <coughs> Excuse me. The presence of a possible aortic injury or a blunt aortic injury is, is an absolute contraindication to floating these uh, catheters, so you need to assess your patient's chest x-ray and determine what your index of suspicion is for an aortic injury. But if you have a positive FAST, you can float the Reboa into zone one, which is supercelia control, take the patient to the operating room, and drop the balloon when you have control. If you have a pelvic fracture, you can actually uh, position the balloon either in zone one or in zone three, and I will show you what those zones are. Again, zone one is the super diaphragmatic or super celiac control. Zone two is above the level of the renals, and zone three is above the level of the pelvis or below the level of the renals. Very effective placement for uh, pelvic fracture uh, and arterial hemorrhage. I think the other adjunct that is going to come into greater use as more of these rooms are built are the hybrid operating rooms. And this is a patient that we did recently um, who was hemodynamically unstable with a bad liver crack, took the patient to the operating room, packed him off, put a Pringle clamp on, and then um, dropped the Pringle long enough to put the catheter up into 
the renal, ar uh, I'm sorry, the hepatic arteries and shoot a, a study demonstrating this amount of extravasation. This is the post-embolization film. The patient stabilized after embolization. We left the packs in. The patient went to the ICU to be warmed up and later went back to the operating room for uh, pack removal. So to put it all together, um, and I'm a big one for take-home points. It comes from teaching a lot of residents. Um, I think that you need to consider damage control both surgery and resuscitation early. Balanced uh, massive transfusion ratios are a good start. Certainly limiting crystal aid resuscitation is a good idea. I don't know where to come down on the colloid side of things. I'm still anti-colloid, but that's a bias. It's not based on data. Um, consider uh, tranexamic acid uh, administration in those patients activating your massive transfusion protocol. Recombinant factor 7A is probably not useful in the year 2014, and it is certainly contraindicated in any patient who gets TXA. Uh, TEG may tailor resuscitation, but again, there's a 30-minute delay, and endovascular te techniques may be better than what we're doing currently. Thank you very much. And the reason that I have East up here is that is the eastern part of New Haven. Thank you.